There's Prof. Professor Trecken and Alexei Alexandrovich that is about treatment of disseminated hermenogenic tumors. And it's held regular regulament. All right. Uh, in Russian, then I'll be in time. Good evening, I'd say. This is my best topic, uh, germ cell tumors. And usually I'm talking about the general ways of treatment. And today I might say for the first time about the experience of Scientific Oncological Center. It might be clear for you how to handle these tumors. So, I believe that during the last 50 years in our Department of Clinical Oncology, we've treated more than 2,000 people with metastatic germ cell tumors. Uh, today, I would like to focus on 919 patients that underwent first line of chemotherapy based on uh, to Plazid. Uh, the first, uh, the majority was the combination of BPLP, but there was also the part of the patients who underwent experimental regimes as CBOP, TBAP, and the ABAP, which I will tell you later on about. Uh, so the um, PFS and OS, according to the prognosis, uh, you all know about this IGCCCG classification that splits every patient on good, intermediate, and poor uh, outcome. And well, in accordance to our experience, the survival rate of this patient is divided in well uh, from 90 to 53 percent, which is reported in leading Western clinics. We have. Uh, compared the effectiveness of two possible approaches for the patients with the good uh, well prognosis. Uh, the right standard approach is three courses according to BEP program or four EP progress, uh, cycles for the patients with the good prognosis. According to our data, it turned out that both combinations are very well uh, well, stood by patients. No one died from the toxicity. And if we have a look at the long term results, we will see that the survival rates for both approaches turned out to be equally effective. So the both variants could be um, used one after another. If you don't have biliatin for some reason, then you could do uh, full cycles of EP, though BEP consider is considered to be less toxic. I won't tell you anything about the uh, patient characteristics, the worst and the most complicated about, is about poor prognosis and will the experience of improvement, the results of the treatment. Uh, one of the combinations was CBO plus 3B regimen. It was one week, one week uh, combination, uh, cisplatin, carboplatin, cisplatin, high dosages. Uh, well, after this, three courses of standard BEP were not to, you know, overdo the cumulative dosage. Uh, right now, this regime would have been called those dens, that, but then it was so only called intensifying regime. We include to the second phase uh, another drug, but it turned out to be quite toxic. Not every fifth, fifth not couldn't could not really finish the prescribed regime. Seven people died from complications. Well, the uh, febrile neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. Neutropenia, well, it's about the main toxicity. The following thing that we decided to try was the TBEP regimen. Uh, that meant that for usual BEP, we added paclitaxel 175 milligrams for cubic meter uh, for day first with all the simulating factors. The combination of TBEP has been started by RTC as well, but with intermediate prognosis. And the studies of second and third phase uh, demonstrated the advantages in comparison with the standard BEP regimen. And we decided to see how well people stand this uh, regimen with poor prognosis. After first 18 patients, we 
were challenged by the unexpectedly high toxicity, the very bad and neuro febrile, febrile neurotrypenia, and the infection well, uh, of every fourth patient, and two patients died from the infectional complications. Those were very weak, you know, patients. But having uh, the doing the retrospective evaluation, I now understand that it was too optimistic to do such an aggressive regimen for a patient with the poor uh, prognosis. If you have ever treated a patient with a poor prognosis, you might know that their ECOG status could be like three or four. And these are not experimental uh, they can't even stand the experimental regime. Sometimes instead of five days of chemotherapy, we prescribe them three days just to improve their perform status from a little bit, just to go to usual dosages for the second course. So the remaining patients got the first BEP course, and after their state improved, since the second course, we added Poclitexel, and we decreased the frequency of the uh, inflammatory complications and no one actually died from toxicity the last regimen that we tested was the accelerated BEP or this a beep or those danced BEP BEP uh, and we decided uh, well the idea came from our hematologist uh, well they used a cop not every two weeks not every three but every two weeks and we decided to try the same thing for BEP why not we kept the same dosages for as we had for three week BEP, but we added um, uh, GCSF uh, and we managed to repeat it every two weeks. So in eight weeks, you actually managed to cure people from metastatic disease. We had 61 patients, part with the uh, intermediate prognosis, the part with poor prognosis. And well, they actually stood the regime in quite well. There was only 11% uh, of those reductions due to toxicity, only seven um, percent of patients were switched from two to three weeks interval and um, well 75 percent of people managed to start the full cycle uh, with the, an average delay less than one week i mean less than 50 days from the start i summed all the survival curve that we got from the standard bep abp cbop tb bbep and pei you see well the the progression and the average survival uh, the survival before without progression is best for TBEP. Uh, if we have a look at the overall survival, uh, we see that well. But this is preliminary data. Those who progressed did not really have enough time to die, and well, that's why their curve is the highest. But if we have the look at the overall survival, we see that TBEP is again. Uh, well, uh, at the first place. And we can actually make the conclusion that the TBEP combination actually improves the long-lasting result. I don't want to go into very much detail because, well, uh, we made a detailed research and, it and we found out that it was a selection of patients. The TBEP was a very aggressive regimen and we, well, artificially chose uh, the better patients for that. So the most complicated went to the BEP combination. So without more detail, the main conclusion from that became that the four, four BEP cycles remain a standard regimen for intermediate and poor risk patients. So further on, we try to have a look at, to, to find out if there is a progress in the treatment of poor risk patients and to have a look what is actually in progress, whether we managed to improve in the recent years the results of the treatment. If we compare 19, before 1997 and after 1997, why 1997? Because that's the switch of regimen, CPOP, TEB regimen. It's kind of the landmark. And we see, if we compare, we see that the survival rate in Improved, but on the other hand, if we compare the time after 1997, we will find out that there is a certain stagnation. Before 2003, after 2003, the curves uh, went to, you know, a flat surface, and well, it, it, these are not improving any longer. We are sad about that because we are doing our best, and the results are not improving any longer. But when we had a look, and when we tried to find the reason for that. It turned out to be that after 2003, the population of the patients was more, you know, uh, 
complicated. So more than three anatomic uh, uh, spheres were uh, suffering metastasis of kidney, liver, I don't know, lung. Can you imagine this category of patients? We have twice as many patients as we had uh, in 1993, or for example, the lung metastasis or metastasis in um, a liver or cerebral metastasis. So m many more than we had in 1993, and I believe this is an explanation to the fact that we couldn't significantly improve the results of the treatment during the recent years. I believe it's, it happened due to the you know heavy patients that we have. It's well known that germ cell metastatic tumors is uh, a part of work of our department, Blochina, uh, for in particular, and. Obviously, there are very complicated patients who cannot even move. They uh, come from other cities, those who could not even come to us before. They were, you know, trying to get their treatment at home. Uh, some of them died. But right now, they actually managed to come. I can't really explain it with some... Uh, 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 well, preliminary mediastinal NG, NSGCT, it's very, well, uh, rare disease when, uh, uh, well, there is a huge tumor in mediastinal part. And they only, they all have very poor risks, actually, very poor prognosis. And according to our data, uh, 41 patients with primary mediastinal NSGCT uh, with bad prognosis, and it turned out that to be that uh, it basically the same. Uh, we see that every third our patients had an operation, had surgery in comparison with half, uh, you know, or intestinal cancer patients. Uh, if we had a look at the survival here, without really going too deep. Well, this is how people write their theses. Uh, they say, well, we invented CBOP, CBOP, These are better than the classical BEP. Let's try using that to cure people. But I believe that won't be really right thing to do because the new regimen started since 2007. And I actually split it BEP before 1997 and after 1997. So we see that before 1907, every, almost all the patients finally died because they didn't have any surgery. You can't really treat a patient, cure a patient with only a patient with mediastinal NSGCT with chemo only. It will become much smaller, yes, from 10 to 1 centimeter. But well, if a surgeon does not really take it from there, the patient will finally die later. But well, still, he or she will. Um, he will. But when the surgeons became, became more involved, we see that for the BEP, this dotted blue line, we see that the effectiveness of BEP came up. So I can't really tell you that TBOP or TBEP is better than classical BEP for preliminary medicinal and CGCT. And as GCT, we made our own uh, prognostic factors. Uh, prove that we we prove that the size of the primary tumor is very important. <coughs> so surgical treatment of patients with NSGCT, uh, the chemotherapy, well, is more or less improving in the country. Uh, BBs are more or less correct, but there is still a lot to do for surgery not enough patients undergo surgery. About 45% of the patients were operated after uh, the end of the chemotherapy. So those were usually abdominal lymphadenectomies because this is the usually where the metastasis happens. And here you see the morphology of the residual tumors. Uh, like you won't find basically anything in a half of patients there will be necrosis one third uh, will be teratoma and well malignant tumor accounts for an average and basically standard figure of about 15% of the whole cases of all the cases 
uh, like residual malignant tumor will be still there. We also analyzed the effectiveness of um, our retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Uh, we made 335 surgeries, and this is the table with the data that actually is very interesting for me. If you have a look at the incidence of the malignant tumor, depending on the size of the residual lymph nodes, it will change like one, two centimeters, two, five, five, ten, more than ten centimeters. This is not the initial metastatic size, but this is the one that the patient went out from the hospital after three or four chemo courses. You'll see that the regardless the size of uh, retroperitoneal lymph nodes, the, the incidence, the frequency of the uh, malignant tumor is basically the same. And uh, we see quite often when five centimeter node patient starts getting treatment, it comes smaller it, and it becomes like one and a half centimeters. And well, and we think, well, let's monitor him without surgeries. And well, if you monitor him without surgery, you'll see that like uh, twenty percent of them, or like thirty percent of them, twenty percent of them will have teratoma, or like fourteen percent of malignant tumor. It's like Russian roulette, you believe every sixth person, uh, every sixth uh, bullet will kill you. And well, I urge you, regardless the size of the residual nodal tumor, you still have to do surgery without any discussion. You shouldn't even ask a patient for uh, you know, an agreement. Why does that mean that much? Have a look at the impact of uh, RP LND on the overall survival. The red line stands for patients with malignant tumor. Obviously, this curve is worse than for the other patients. They have the survival of about 90, and here we see 60, but still we have a lot of people who survived. We treated them. Uh, well, even though we couldn't even kill the whole tumor after chemotherapy. Another unexpected and surprising discovery turned out to be that five year overall survivor was higher for the group of radically operated patients, regardless of the morphology. So if the patient has necrosis, and even if you remove it 100%, though you don't know before that whether he has necrosis or not, if you remove it, patient will be living better than if you don't do that. Like you can't really study the whole tumor. What pathomorphologist could do with 10 centimeter tumor? Like, I don't know, he could take one, two, three blocks, for example, from that volume. And that's why there is still a, side, a, a, a big chance of the residual cells there, and we have to do the resection. Besides, we had a look at the survival of the patients with the uh, lymph nodes there he, that weren't operated uh, for various reasons, first and foremost because of resectability reasons. Um, so the patients five-year survival of these patients were 73 in comparison with 58 people who survived it after this planectomy. So I urge you, uh, regardless the size, please do surgery. This is very much important. So we told that it's needed to operate the patient. And the question that's been discussed for very a lot of time, what's, what shall we do in case of residual um, lymph nodes less than one centimeter? Shall we operate him or not? We never operate such people in our oncological center, but we had a look at that. We had 133 patients like that. And well, his um, RP lymph nodes became very small, but if we re only monitor them, then the recess uh, well frequency was about like 4%, right? These are people who had basically necrosis. It's impossible to get less than 4%. That's why this landmark of one centimeter is a good one. It works. If you have lymph nodes less than one centimeter, you can keep it there. You can only monitor it. If it's bigger, you have to operate them. All right, I'm wrapping up about the teratoma growing syndrome. Uh, everyone basically knows about that, and when we face it, we have to do some stupid stuff. Uh, the tumor 
grow smaller. Well, we have to we start doing the first, second, third, and fourth line of chemotherapy, and it's very bad for the patient. We had 50 patients of a kind, and 45 from of them uh, showed the decrease in tumor markers. A uh, number of them uh, had proceeded with uh, lymph nodes, and well. Almost all of them survived, 91%, though 11 of them did not have any surgery for different reasons. And obviously, half of them had further growth of lymph nodes, and only half of them survived, unfortunately. So, well, that means that if you see that something is growing, though the markers are okay or decreasing, never start doing the second uh, well, never, never forget the surgery. I won't tell you about the recess. So why actually are we doing that? The progress is going with baby steps. Uh, with the poor prognosis, medium prognosis, we improved it and it became better, but well, if everyone in Russia treat as we do that in our center, we will be living in a different world. So the situation is very bad. There is no real statistical data that there is a general one that actually includes the first stage. So in the first five years survival of metastatic patients is about 45%. According to our data, uh, metastatic patients, and what we see, you, you have so have different uh, how complicated they are. For our data, we cured 78% of them. So I urge you to treat them correctly, to send them to correct centers. So and well, despite the fact that the progress is walking with baby steps, let's continue working. Thank you.